Hello and welcome to Psych 3020, lecture number five. And uh, apologies again for having to cancel the lecture this week, uh, thanks to vomiting and so forth. So instead I'm giving the lecture uh, this evening and I have a bucket on standby and thanks to the magic of video editing, I'll be able to actually edit out any vomits, which is something I would not be able to do this afternoon. Okay, so what we're going to do in this lecture, number five, is talk about uh, how to create a test. So this is stuff that might be very useful for your assignment one and your assignment two. All right, let's go uh, get on with it. Right, how to create a test. So what's this lecture about? What I'm going to do is go through the stages of how to create a test and how to evaluate it. So remember that uh, sort of box and arrow diagram I gave you way back in lecture number one. And uh, what we're going to do is look at test creation, look at test evaluation, eva 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 examine key issues along the way, uh, including test conceptualization, creating the materials, uh, designing and running studies to assess psychometric properties so we're talking validity, we're talking reliability and then finally uh, how to assess item quality uh, where we're looking at uh, strategies for seeing whether your items uh, each of the individual items are contributing to for example reliability or validity which is really useful for when you want to uh, improve your test by sort of tweaking the items within it Okay, and uh, yeah, finally, uh, test revision. Okay, so here's the steps that we would typically go through. How to create a measure of human behaviour. So, step number one, we've got to decide what we're going to measure, why we want to measure it, how we're going to measure it. With step two, we're going to create the materials we need to uh, run our test. Uh, step three, we're going to design and run those studies to assess uh, validity, reliability, standardization and item quality. So again, all things that are mapped onto what you're having to do in both your assignments. And uh, if they all work, if those studies uh, provide decent evidence for reliability, validity and so forth, uh, then we can still take the next step, step four, which is uh, considering how to improve our measure by looking at the item uh, quality statistics. And finally, releasing our new measure into the wild, watching it run free and improving the world forever. OK, let's start with step number one and uh, go into each of these in a bit more detail. Right, step, one one, step number one, test conceptualization. So what we're going to measure, why we're going to measure it, how we're going to measure it. OK, and uh, here's an example uh, from the hazard perception test that I mentioned in lecture number one. Okay, so first of all, before I start started with anything, I would have decided uh, what I want to measure. So I've decided I want to measure drivers' hazard perception ability. But crucially, uh, so yeah, there's a scene from my hazard perception test, and there's a hazard hopefully spotted on the road ahead. Where if this camera car does not uh, do some slowing down, then it might well crash into that uh, van. So, I want to measure drivers' hazard perception. Okay, why? Oh, so, I need a ra what's my rationale for wanting to measure drivers' hazard perception ability? Well, I want to reduce the frequency and the severity of car crashes. And uh, how am I going to do it? I decided I'm going to use a video based uh, simulation test. Okay, so. Uh, where I've got a rationale for why I'm using one of those as well. Uh, okay, well there's there's a couple of uh, screenshots there from the video instructions that we created for Queensland Transport for the hazard perception test. All right. So test conceptualization. So here's just a sort of checklist of things to consider when you're putting together your. Uh, test for both assignment one and assignment two. So first of all, what work has been done before on this issue? Okay, so that is there's obviously no point in creating a new test if someone's already done it uh, better than you're going to do it. You've, obviously, whatever you do has got to provide some sort of advantage over what uh, previously exists, even if it's something as simple as oh, your new test is it takes a little bit longer to administer and therefore uh, takes up less people's time, therefore is more practical. 
Uh, second thing you've got to consider is who exactly is going to be using this test. Uh, so to give you an example with our hazard perception test, for the research test uh, we didn't have to worry too much about making the instructions um, sort of very, very, very understandable because the research test is generally being used on uh, sort of uh, well psychology undergraduates. However, when they decided to use as a perception test as part of the license, part of licensing, uh, they're rightly very concerned that they didn't want the test to discriminate against people, for example, with uh, poorer levels of education or poorer levels of uh, English. So, for, for example, people where English was not their first language. And so, uh, with that in mind, for the licensed version of the test, we actually created a uh, video, a little five-minute video, which we actually tested out on people who were, uh, who's, for whom English was not their first language. And, uh, yeah, basically found that, uh, uh, we actually found that people, uh, as long as they had a reading age of, I think, uh, age or three or above, uh, were able to understand the uh, test and what it was doing. Right, um, what's the context in which the test is going to be used? So you never create a test in isolation that can be used across all contexts, okay? It's always, um, it's always, it always matters when, uh, when and where and why you're going to be using that test. Uh, how long or effortful you can make that measure. So remember all that stuff from, re from reliability where the longer the test, the more items in the test, the more uh, reliable, at least the more internally consistent it's likely to become, but the cost of that, uh, of that is that the test becomes longer and longer and longer. So, for example, one key consideration for the assignment two, where we're limiting people to about 10 items for their questionnaire measure, the main reason for that is that uh, when we compile all of the questions from all of, the, all of the 20 tutorial groups, we end up with a questionnaire that's pretty long, Okay, uh, but so it's not the case that we, if we gave everyone say 20 items, then you'd be there for about three hours filling this thing in, uh, and so we wanted to make it so that it, it could be completed within a reasonable time frame. So that is, you've got to bear in mind sort of pragmatics like that. Um, yeah, uh, are there any practicalities to be considered? Uh, okay, so very, very. This could be very, very simple stuff. So, for example, when we first started doing. Uh, research into driving on older adults, that is old adults aged uh, 65 and over, uh, then uh, when, we're looking, when we started doing the hazard perception test, then the very first thing we did was actually just print out the instructions which are much larger font size, uh, because the idea is when we're using it on 20 year olds, then yeah, that's fine to have a small font size, whereas if you're using it on over 65 year olds where the eyesight might not be quite so good, you might screw up the entire test simply because they can't read the instructions. Okay, uh, yeah, practicalities. So uh, with any situation, there's a limit on your budget. Uh, there's a limit on how much time you have. So for example, a lot of the constraints associated with assignment two are literally just down to how uh, the length of time we've got to actually put assignment two into practice and that is going to put constraints on it. Um, if it's the case that we've got a test that we want to be administered to thousands of people like say for example that has a perception test then it can't be a test that requires a, a huge amount of effort on the part of uh, examiners so that is if uh, this test is going to be administered to say 40,000 people a year uh, then to actually have all those people sit down for three hours with an examiner simply might be too uh, expensive to do. However, if you've got a test where it's just going to be used, uh, say, in a clinical setting where you do have hours to spend with each of your clients, then uh, it might well be possible to use a much uh, longer and more involved test. Okay. All right. Are there any uh, ethical issues to uh, consider? Okay. So, as in just with any other psychological uh, research, uh, you've got to make sure that uh, you're not doing anything unethical. Okay, so for example, uh, with the assignment two questionnaire, we're going to make it uh, anonymous. Uh, uh, I did run into problems a few years back where what we used to do was to get uh, everybody to, uh, uh, people filled in the, all of the questions except the question questionnaire they created themselves. 
but then we actually, actually found there's there's one case where I think it was a mature age student was uh, filling out questions uh, and because it was possible to identify them because of the questionnaire they didn't fill out uh, and some of the other questions in the questionnaire were actually asking about quite sensitive meshes, uh, issues I think they were asking about uh, depression and anxiety it was actually possible to identify that person and uh, quite understandably she wasn't very pleased with that uh, so that's why now we're insisting that uh, everybody when they're filling in this questionnaire you fill in everything including your own questionnaire because that makes it uh, uh, much more anonymous okay uh, if your responses are anonymous this does create uh, problems so for example uh, even in a very simple situation where you've got a, a say a two-stage thing where you want to, people to fill in a questionnaire and then go away for a week and then come back and do something else the next week uh, if that's anonymous then it's very hard to actually link the two different sets of data okay so uh, there are ways to do it you can get people to invent a special code that will link the two bits of data without uh, recording what their names are but the point is you need to uh, bear all that in mind okay and uh, yeah is there any potentially uh, sensitive or offensive content in your questionnaires that you need to be uh, mindful of for example are you uh, I don't know uh, uh, are you asking about involvement in uh, I don't know group monkey sex involving utensils or something similarly sensitive all right okay so that's our stage one. On to stage two where we need to create the materials that are needed. Alright. Okay, so here's a checklist of things to consider here. Right, first of all, we've got to decide the format of uh, test items. Okay, so we'll see this is going to be, depending on, is it a questionnaire or uh, some video based simulation or whatever. Okay, uh, for example, for assignment two, we're so generally going to be sticking to Likert type uh, sort of agree disagree uh, responses. Okay, and uh, also you've got to decide exactly how you're going to score this test at this stage. Uh, and crucially, hopefully this is something you will all have, have addressed in your week four tutorials where you created the. Uh, a questionnaire you're going to be using in assignment two. Uh, one crucial thing hopefully you were testing when you were piloting it was to ensure there was sufficient variability in people's uh, responses if applicable. Okay, So that is you've got a normal reference test, it's looking at an in individual differences, personality measure like extroversion or arachnophobia where the whole point of the thing is to be able to tell people apart. Okay, you won't be able to tell people apart if there is no variation in the responses. Okay, so that's when you did your piloting, and hopefully, you've picked items where, uh, at least within your groups, you've got uh, people responding at both ends of that questionnaire. Right. Um, next item, uh, so uh, would be uh, content uh, validity. So whether the items sample the domain of interest uh, sufficiently. So that is. If you're asking about, say, uh, impulsivity, uh, are you actually covering uh, all, all aspects uh, of impulsivity that you want to cover? Okay, if it's a criterion-based uh, reference test, then is the test actually uh, testing people on your criterion? So obviously that's something I have to bear in mind when I'm, for example, designing the uh, examination for this course. Uh, whether is it the case that uh, the questions I'm asking do they uh, are all of those questions relevant to the criteria, which is uh, what I've decided people need to know in order to be able to allow be allowed to pass Psych 3020. Okay, and uh, how many items are you going to have in your test? Okay, so again, more items tend to mean your test ends up more reliable, but the cost of that is it can take longer to complete. So that's your general trade-off that you're thinking about there. Okay, and remember what we talked about last week with the uh, face validity. Okay, it's uh, it's not crucial f to have face validity in order for your test to have actual validity, uh, but it might be use still useful in some circumstances to have face validity simply for public relations reasons to improve the quality of your data. So what, what I mean by that is to minimise, for example, missing values, things like that, because people uh, aren't. Uh, don't think your test is measuring what it's supposed to be measuring. So 
if you think your test uh, would benefit from having some face validity, does it actually have any face validity? And the easy way to test that would be just to show it to a bunch of people and say whether they think it's uh, a decent measure of whatever it is it's supposed to be measuring. Right, okay. If you've got a uh, questionnaire or a written examination type of uh, instrument, here's some things to uh, bear in mind. Okay, so a lot of these things are all sort of on one level, sort of uh, pretty obvious things to uh, consider. But I thought it's obviously worth having as a checklist because as soon as we say something's obvious, then uh, of course people forget all about it. Okay, so obviously avoid any ambiguity, avoid lack of clarity. Uh, if, you achieve, if it's an achievement test, are people going to get the answers right or wrong for the right reasons? Okay, so that is, I could obviously create uh, examination questions where uh, people might get them all wrong or could, might, people might get them all right, but not because of how much they know about the course. It could be something else like, I make the wording so convoluted that only uh, people with super high IQ can actually understand the question irrespective of whether they actually understand uh, the content, and that would be inappropriate. Uh, generally good to uh, include uh, reversed uh, questions, okay, so that is uh, because some people have got biases as to whether they like to, if you've got uh, questions where you're asking whether people agree or disagree with that question, uh, if you have a few reversed items in there, then it means that if you've got people where they've got a, some bias towards agreeing or disagreeing, then this sort of balances that out a little bit. All right, uh, multiple choice, very, very important and sometimes very difficult to do, is to make sure all of the distractors in your multiple choice question, so if you've got four, it uh, four items, as we have in the final exam, you'll have one correct answer and three uh, distracted three incorrect answers. Uh, obviously that multi-choice question will be uh, useless if those three distractors aren't sufficiently uh, plausible. Okay, so that is could a respondent guess the correct answer without actually knowing it. Okay, here's some uh, different types of uh, question format you could be using. So, uh, selected response. So, example here would be uh, multiple choice. Uh, matching options give you an example of that in a second, uh, true-false questions uh, and uh, what we call constructed response would be like your assignments where they are, they are or, or the, some, of, some of the online quizzes where you're actually having to type in or write uh, a response, so it's like fill in the blank or write an essay or account of something, so something where you're actually uh, the uh, person doing the test ha is constructing something rather than just selecting something Okay, all right, so here's our multi choice. Okay, uh, psychological test and interview and a case study are A, psychological assessment tools, B, standardized behavioral samples, or C, reliable assessment instruments. Okay, the idea is you've got uh, the STEM, what's known as the STEM, which is simply the uh, question part of your multiple choice question. You've got uh, the correct alternative. Okay, which speaks itself, the right answer, and then you've got your two uh, distractors there, which are obviously the incorrect answers, where the idea, the clever bit with writing multi choice is making those sufficiently plausible. Here, here's an example of what I mean by matching options. Okay, so we can have a number of questions, and then one set of options that applies to all three of the questions. Okay, so there you go. Uh, what test would you use for a two group unrelated design normally distributed uh, and you can choose from uh, those seven different uh, options there okay so that's an example of match up here example of matching choice and down here an example of uh, multiple choice all right okay when you've uh, started creating your thing, the one thing that you did in that week four was to do uh, a pilot run on your data, So, in th as in that's where you uh, hopefully put it all up and uh, all the original, big long list of original questions onto Qualtrics, uh, fill them in just to get some like rough and ready data just to get a feel for how the questions were performing. Okay, this is really, really useful. 
and it doesn't uh, but when I say pilot research it doesn't have to just mean uh, testing out your questions it also involves uh, looking at previous literature to see what people have done before uh, it could involve interviewing people who might know something about the area um, another way you can do it is ask people more open-ended more constructive form versions of the test if appropriate so where they uh, yeah, you, uh, instead of giving them a list, uh, a list of things to select from, you say, "Ah, oh, could you write down all of the things that are relevant to this question down here?" So it's more open-ended, and that will help you generate ideas for uh, possible items. Um, yeah, in fact, like so, for thirty twenty in previous semesters, we've had uh, I've used uh, sort of uh, open-ended. Uh, short answer questions and uh, the sort of uh, answers people were coming up with were very useful for when I wanted to convert some of those questions into multiple choice format because I could use uh, the some of the wrong answers that people were often coming up with as my distractors. Okay, uh, I can get uh, you can get people to complete a uh, sort of faked up uh, initial version of the test and comment on it. So that's more or less what you did in uh, week four for your assignment two. Uh, another thing you can do is get people to do a like, running commentary, uh, so it's called a verbal protocol, about what they're thinking about as they complete a draft of the test. Okay, so uh, the advantage of that sort of thing is that you might well find out that uh, what people are thinking, uh, how people are interpreting uh, your questions, might actually be not what you intended. Okay, so that is, you might have written all these questions with a certain idea in mind. And then by listening to this verbal commentary, uh, you might discover that, in fact, the people responding to this questionnaire have actually got quite a different idea, which, of course, will totally screw up your test. OK, we're on to step three now. OK, that's how to uh, design and run studies to assess validity, reliability, standardization and item quality okay so this is the uh, big step okay and it's the one where it uh, involves us actually having to run some empirical uh, studies okay so hopefully looking back at all those previous lectures you have already have got a pretty good idea about what I mean when I uh, say you've got to run studies to assess the uh, validity and uh, reliability of the measure uh, but one thing I haven't uh, covered yet is uh, how we actually can test the quality of individual items okay uh, but oh, yeah, I just uh, refresh your memory. Uh, okay, uh, typical validity, reliab reliability, study design. Okay, imagine I've got my electrician competency test. Correlation between the participants' uh, test scores and their actual job performance ratings would be the criterion validity coefficient. So here's a study. I recruit loads of technicians, uh, loads of electricians. I get them all to do my test. And then I get uh, an expert electrician to evaluate each participant doing the job for real. Okay, where when I get the data back from the test, I can look at that to evaluate things like internal consistency to evaluate the reliability of the test. And this uh, expert uh, rating is going to be my criteria. So the correlation between the test and my criteria is going to be my uh, it's going to be my criteria. It's going to give me. Um, an understanding of how valid that particular test is. Okay, right, item quality assessment. Okay, we want to determine at some stage which of the individual items or questions within our test is uh, uh, helping increase the reliability and the validity of the test, which is a good thing, and which of those items is suppressing either the reliability or the validity of the test. Okay, in which case we might consider wanting to get rid of them. Okay, because they're weakening the test. Okay, so basically if I can come up with some measures about whether each of the individual questions is good or bad, then that will allow us to improve the test overall, because we will be able to decide which items we definitely want to keep, and which items we want to uh, get rid of or reword. Okay, so typically what I'd do in any situation like this is create far more items than you're ever going to possibly need uh, with the understanding that you're expecting at least some of them to be bad and even if 
some of them aren't that bad uh, that's fine because it just means that you can if you're going to shorten the test you can then just be picking the very very best rather than just merely the good ones okay so we want to stick in far more items than we need in the initial version in order to give us plenty of to choice um, in assignment 2 uh, we're only giving you 10 items in an ideal world if uh, say semesters were say twice as long as they actually were then you would have been able to say put in a 50 item questionnaire each and then uh, choose say the best 20 items to go forward into your final version of your questionnaire okay the only reason we didn't do that is that the questionnaire would be just simply too long otherwise okay but that's what we would like to do in real life okay so recruit lots of going back to our electrician competence test we recruit lots of electricians get them all to do our test where we're including more items in this test version than we need so we've got the scope to remove poor items right so what are the options uh, that we have when uh, analyzing the quality of our items okay we've got a few different uh, options that we can use and uh, uh, they uh, th these ones here are specifically for aptitude type tests or achievement tests uh, where these are tests where there are there is a correct answer and an incorrect answer for everything so for example examination an IQ test uh, a competence test anything like that okay Option number one, we can work out what's called the item difficulty index, and this is simply the proportion of respondents that get the item incorrect. Secondly, we can work out what's called the item discrimination index for reliability. Okay, so don't get confused between item difficulty and item discrimination, they're two different things. Uh, this uh, this is an index here will give you a number that gives an indicator of how similar the items is uh, similar the item is to the rest of the items in your scale so it has in how much it's contributing to the internal consistency a uh, third thing we can do is work out the item discrimination index for validity so that is to what extent does an item contribute to uh, that scales relationship to for example some external validity criterion that you're using Okay, uh, if uh, your test is comprised of multi-choice answers, then what we might want to do is look at the pattern of responses across all of the incorrect as well as the correct answers, because that's uh, often very revealing. And uh, there's also lots of further in-depth examination you can do. So, uh, for example, are there particularly item items there that respondents who you would expect to get them correct? So that is maybe high, very high scoring respondents otherwise where they come to one particular item and uh, they're all getting it wrong okay which might indicate a problem uh, secondly uh, are there any items where respondents who ought to get it uh, wrong as in they're very low respond uh, low scoring respondents for example for that particular item are they getting a very substan uh, substantially above chance uh, remember uh, uh, last week I think I talked about uh, our uh, colonoscopy uh, examination that we completed where we actually got a bunch of undergraduate psychologists to complete the exam where the idea is that uh, they uh, would have absolutely no idea, they shouldn't have any idea of the answers to any of the questions and the idea is that was a test of whether they could nonetheless guess the right answer because, the, uh, because of the way it was worded okay just by using whatever sort of strategies Okay, and the idea is if, if there are items in there where even the, the people who shouldn't know anything about colonoscopy were getting getting them right, then that's probably an indication of a poor item. Okay, so uh, that was uh, achievement uh, assessment tests. Uh, the flip side of the coin are personality tests, for example your assignment two okay and uh, here's some uh, options you can use for this one so when I say personality tests I just mean uh, anything where there is no correct answer as such so that is uh, people are high in extroversion or low in extroversion there is no right or wrong answer as there is with an exam okay uh, right first thing you can do is examine a uh, histogram or frequency table for of responses to each item uh, is there an appropriate uh, spread across uh, across the options for that item 
Uh, you can work out the item discrimination index for reliability. So this is one of the things that we're asking you to do uh, for assignment two. Uh, and uh, this basically is asking how similar the item is to the rest of the items in the scale, as in to what extent is, are in these individual items contributing to internal consistency. Okay, and we show you how to do that in the assignment two briefing in SPSS. Uh, you can still go ahead and work out the item discrimination index for validity. So this is asking the question, does an item co contribute to the scales relationship uh, to an external criteria measure? And uh, finally, uh, exactly the same as before, further index the examination. Are there any items that respondents you would expect to score high are scoring low? Any items where the respondents who ought to score low are scoring high? Okay, so there's uh, all, lots, all sorts of options you've got for different types of tests. Right, so first of all let's look at how we would do the item quality for an aptitude type test. Okay, imagine we've got these eight people here. Uh, Jeff, Monique, Tegan, Derek, Zoe, Jessica, Simon and Maggie. Uh, and those people are doing this uh, very simple four item test. And uh, here's their scores. All right, so uh, basically a tick obviously means they get the item correct because it's an aptitude test. Uh, cross means that they're getting the item incorrect. Okay, so that's our data. Uh, how do we actually go about evaluating item quality? All right, first of all, let's look at item difficulty index or P. All right. This is very simple. All we need to do is count up the total number of correct responses for each item and then divide by the total number of people. Okay. Okay, and so here's an example. Let's take item number one here. So here we can see that, uh, okay, Jeff's got it correct. That's one. Monique's not got it right, Tegan's got it right, so two, Derek's got it right, three, Zoe's got it right, four, Jessica's got it right, five, uh, Simon's got it right, six, Maggie, Maggie's got it wrong. So overall, uh, item one, uh, six people got it correct out of a total of eight respondents. All that means is the item difficulty index, therefore, is six over eight, which is 0.75. So that is... Uh, 75% of those people are getting item number one uh, correct. Okay, so we can go ahead and do that for all four of these items. Okay, so, so item number one is uh, uh, six, uh, six correct out of eight, 0.75. Item number two, this is obviously a much more difficult item where only Zoe, Simon and Maggie are getting it correct. So that's three people getting correct out of eight. 0.38 difficulty uh, index. Uh, item number three, uh, one, two, three, four people getting it correct out of a total of eight, so that's half of them are getting it correct. And item number four, a little bit easier, one, two, three, four, five, so five out of eight, so 0.63. So you can think of these as percentages as well if you prefer 75%, 38%, 50%, 63%. And basically that just tells you literally how difficult the item is, where obviously item number two is the most difficult and item number one is the easiest in terms of the proportion of people who are getting it correct. Okay, so there you go, item one easiest, item two most difficult. Uh, but notice with item three, where we've got uh, half the people getting it wrong, half the people getting it right, that's actually the cutoff we would want uh, to give the optimal uh, opportunity for telling uh, people apart on whatever it was we were measuring, uh, assuming it's not multi multiple choice. Okay, <coughs> so a bit more, little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, right, if uh, you've got a non-referenced aptitude style test, then uh, right, which can be scored incorrect or, or incorrect, then what you want to do is maximize that uh, opportunity uh, for the test to be able to tell people apart who are high or low in whatever it is you're measuring intelligence or psych 3020 knowledge or whatever. Okay, so optimal strategy, strategy to achieve this is to adjust your items until you get your item difficulty index to be 50%. 
So half the people get it right, one, two, three, four, five, and half, half the people, one, two, three, four, five, get that item incorrect. Uh, what that means is if you go for that, you're likely to get a good spread of scores, uh, which uh, gives the opportunity, although it doesn't certainly doesn't guarantee, that the item will uh, tell apart, be able to tell apart people who are high and low in the thing you're measuring. Right, with the multi-choice questions, however, uh, there is a complication, and that complication is that you need to correct for the fact that people can guess the answer. Okay, and the way we do that is as follows. So, imagine we've got a five-option multiple-choice question. That means your chance of guessing the right answer without actually knowing what the answer to the question is, is 20%. Okay, so it's basically five options, 100 divided by 5, 20%. So this means that the optimal difficulty uh, item difficulty index would be halfway between this chance level, 20%, and everyone being correct, which would be 100%. So what's halfway between 20% and 100%? Well, we can calculate that by just adding 20% to 100%, which is 120%, dividing that by 2, gives us our answer of 60%. So that is, if we've got a five option multi-choice where there's a 20% chance of getting it right without knowing what the right answer is, then we want to get our item difficulty index to be 60% if our objective is to tell people apart in the most optimal way. Uh, here's another example. Three option multi-choice. Uh, the chance is now 33% that you'll just be able to guess the right answer without actually knowing the uh, question, so 100 divided by 3. Uh, this means that the optimal item difficulty index for that sort of a question would be halfway between 33% and 100%. 33 plus 100 divided by 2 is 66.5%. Uh, so the item difficulty index needs to be 66.5% to give that sort of optimal split. Okay, so just to try and make all of this concrete, what I've done is uh, picked out some real item difficulty index, and just to show you that I'm not just making all of this up, uh, when, I actually, when you actually go and take any multiple choice uh, examination into uh, the uh, university to be scored on their special multi-choice marking uh, machine, uh, that machine automatically uh, kicks out these scores uh, for you to help you evaluate your questions. Okay, uh, this is actually a, uh, from a previous uh, multi-choice exam uh, with four option response options uh, where the mean was about 21 out of uh, 30, so uh, what's that, about 60-66%. Uh, okay, right. and these are the item difficulty indexes we actually got for each of the questions. Okay, so what do these numbers mean? Okay, so this means question number one, 92% of people got question number one right. So that's question number one is obviously a very easy question. Uh, question number two was a sort of middlingly difficult question, about only about uh, half the people got it correct. Question three, also a very uh, easy question, 90% of people getting it right. Uh, question number four, actually quite a hard question, only about a quarter of people getting it right. Uh, let's look on through, see question number 12 here. That's only about 11% uh, of people are now getting this one uh, correct. So obviously question 12 for whatever reason was very, very uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, sort of looking on through, question 24 was pretty difficult, but uh, question 26 was very easy. Right, uh, if uh, in 3020, if it was norm referenced, and so my, the aim of the exam was to best differentiate uh, sort of uh, people who knew their 3020 stuff and people who didn't know it. What would be the uh, ideal for that discrimination? Well, it's a four option multi choice, so that's uh, uh, the chance would be 100 divided by 4, which is 25%. So you've got a 25% chance of getting the question, uh, any question right by simply guessing. So what's a halfway point between 25% and 100%, it's uh, 100 plus 25 divided by 2 is 63%, 0.63. Uh, 
Okay, so that means uh, in out of these particular questions, question 13 is coming pretty close, 0.65. Uh, question 23 is hitting the nail on the head uh, with a 0.63. So those questions, if this is a normal reference test, uh, are doing the best job of telling apart the strong students from maybe the weaker students. Okay, how about maximum discrimination for norm referenced personality uh, type tests? How do we do that? Okay, so uh, here's our, that speed questionnaire I was talking about in lecture number one that you filled in. How often do you exceed 70 miles an hour on the motorway? Uh, and there were six options from sort of not at all to very frequently over here. Okay, uh, ideally what we'd want is for about 50% of people to be in these first three options and 50% of people to be in these second three options options that will maximize the spread of uh, scores okay so we don't quite have that here so obviously there's a big majority of people seem to be responding to uh, I, uh, options uh, three four and five okay right if uh, we wanted to redesign this question test to or this so if we wanted to redesign this particular option to uh, make it more balanced between the left hand side of the graph and the right hand side of the graph what would we do? Well, we could simply do this, change this number here. This, how often do you exceed 70 km miles an hour on the motorway? We could change that to how often do you exceed 80 miles an hour on the motorway or 90 miles an hour on the motorway? And you would expect that would have the effect of shifting a whole bunch of people down from this way into this section, okay? Uh, until you got a sort of a more even spread. Okay. So, yeah, one thing you can do for your personality type test is simply to pull out, plot out a histogram for every one of your items, or frequency table would do the job as well. Okay, and uh, just have a little eyeball of that to see whether you've got your even uh, spread or not. Exactly what you did in the, for week four with assignment two. Okay, um, importantly, it, uh, if, if you do turn out that you've got individual items that are skewed, it's not the end of the world. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you've got one or two skewed items in that the overall questionnaire uh, won't be norm nice and normally distributed for you. Okay, so it's the sort of thing, don't get too worried if you end up uh, with a pattern like this. So for example, this question here, yeah, they could have fixed it, they didn't. And uh, this questionnaire is, is, uh, is a questionnaire that has strong reliability and validity, so it worked for them despite uh, having this uh, skewed data here. All right, that leads us on to uh, uh, item discrimination index for reliability. So this is we, previously we were talking about the item difficulty index. This is the item discrimination index, which is something completely different. All right, and uh, this is the thing you're going to be working out for your assignment twos. All right, uh, this is we're going to start off with the example where we're looking at uh, an attitude type test. So people get with uh, items where they can either get it correct with a tick or wrong with a cross. Okay, and what we want to work out is a number that will tell us how each of these four items uh, is uh, contributing to the internal consistency of the test. To what extent are each of these items um, uh, correlating with the other items. Okay, this is what we do first of all. Let's work out the total score for the quiz. So let's count up uh, correct answers for each person. So Jeff has got one, two, three, three, score three. Monique's only got one question right, so she gets a score one. Tegan's got uh, question one right and question three right, so she gets score two and so forth. Second thing we do is uh, we're going to define what we're going to call the upper group and the lower group as being the top 25 and bottom 25 based on their overall total score to this for the test. Okay, so let's look up these numbers. We've got to pick the uh, well out of eight people. The top 25 percent is going to be out of eight is going to be two people. Okay, so who are the two people who got the highest score? Da, 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 that's Zoe and Simon. So that is my upper group will be the highest scoring 25% in this case, that's Zoe and Simon. 
Uh, right, the bottom 25%, so I'm going to look for the two people with the low scores, that's uh, Jessica, who got a score of 1, and Monique, who got a score of 1. Okay, so there we go, my upper group is going to be Zoe and Simon, my lower group is going to be Jessica and uh, Monique. Okay. Right, then what you do is for each individual item, you want to count up uh, the number of people out of the high scoring group who got the item correct and the number of people in that low scoring lower group who got it correct. Okay, so let's look at that again. There's my, uh, I've rearranged the data now, so I've just taken just the two people in the upper group, the high scoring group, uh, and taken all the, the people in the low scoring group, the lower group down here. Okay, we're just looking at their data on its own. So for each item, count up the number of people in the high scoring group who got the item correct. So for item number one, two out of two of them got it right. For item number one uh, in the upper group, but only one out of two got it right in the lower group. For item number two, both of them got it right in the upper group, and none of them got it right in the lower group, and so forth. Okay, there you go. So, item number one, two high scores got it correct. Uh, that means letter U is going to become two, and one high low score got it correct, which is the uh, letter L, is going to become one. Okay, two high scores in total, which is what we call n suffix u, that's going to be 2, and two low scores in total, that's n suffix uh, l. Right, so we've got four numbers now, uh, capital U, capital L, nu and nl, and we shove this into a formula, this formula here, which is the formula for the item discrimination index. Okay, so just to recap, remember U is the number of people in that upper group who are getting the item correct. L is the number of people in the lower group who are getting the item correct. N is N, N U is the total number of people in the upper group, and N L is the total number of people in the lower group. Right. So. Item number one, two highest scores got it right, so U is two, one low score got it, got it correct, L is one, two high scores in the total, N, U is two, two low scores in total, N, L is uh, going to also be two. So item discrimination index is therefore U, two, divided by N, U, which is two, so two over two, minus uh, L, which is one, over N, L, which is two. So it's going to affect be two over two minus one over two, uh, that's going to become 1 minus a half, which is equal to a half. Okay, so this is, going to be, this is one of the formula that you'll find on the examination uh, uh, formula sheet. So you don't have to memorise this formula, but you may have to do the calculation, but you'll get lots of practice in doing this calculation in some of the forthcoming online tutorial quizzes. Alright. Uh, okay, here I've uh, worked out for all of the remaining three items. Okay, so you can see item number two, U is two, because both of those got it correct. L is zero, because neither of those two guys got it right. Uh, these numbers stay the same throughout. Okay, so uh, basically uh, two divided by two is one, uh, minus zero divided by two uh, is equal to uh, put those uh, so basically one minus zero is equal to one. Similarly for item three and item four, uh, where you've got one, Monique's getting item four correct, so that makes L equals to one rather than zero. So that becomes that's going to become overall uh, two over two minus one over two. One minus a half is a half. Okay, right. Basically. This number here, the higher this number, uh, the better the discrimination. Okay, so this is saying that items two and three are contributing the most to the internal consistency of the test, while items one and four contribute less. I think in this particular example, because I've kept it so simple, uh, they're all actually pretty good, so we wouldn't be worried about any of those. Um, but it is still the case that, yeah, two and three are the very best.
Okay, so uh, in terms of the item discrimination index score, or little d, okay, uh, if it's plus one, that's the uh, absolute maximum it could be, so that's when all the people in the upper group are getting it uh, particular item correct and all the people in the lower group are getting the right item wrong so that's the best discrimination uh, so D is going to be equal to 1 as you saw on that last slide uh, D can go down to minus 1 but this is the bizarre crazy nightmare situation where all the people in the lower group have got the item correct and all the people in the upper group have got it wrong which probably means yeah, if I saw something like that in the examination, that probably means that I've uh, entered the wrong answer into the multiple choice uh, scoring machine. Okay, so D equals 1, then all the high scorers get it right, all the low scorers get it wrong. Uh, okay, so if we define those groups by the overall test score, then the closer it is to 1, then the more similar the item is to other items. Okay, so it's contributing to uh, reliability. Yeah, so there you go upper group if D equals 1 all these people have got the item correct if D equals 1 all of these people here have got the item incorrect right if D equals uh, 0 then it means that there is no difference in performance between high and low scorers okay so that is uh, there's exactly the same proportion of people in this group who are getting it right as in this group okay so essentially uh, in this context it would mean that the item simply doesn't have any relationship whatsoever with any of the other items it must be measuring something totally different it's doing you no good whatsoever in terms of the reliability okay, okay so that is this is uh, not helping your reliability of your measure out one bit okay D equals minus one all the low scorers get it right all the high scorers get it wrong uh, and yeah this is the crazy scenario where the world has gone upside down okay where all the losers have got the item correct okay yep bizarre okay so here's some uh, real ones so uh, that I've taken from uh, SAC 3020 multiple choice exam just to prove uh, these are real statistics and uh, yet yeah, the multi-choice UQ multi-choice machine automatically will calculate these for uh, all of any multi-choice exam that's uh, submitted so this is the uh, thing earlier I was talking about how excited I get by looking at, over the, the item statistics or the exam these are the statistics I was talking about of course other lectures won't know what these mean so they'll probably just be like looking over them but you can be sure that I'll be sort of picking over these in great detail to pick the very best items right, to work out which were the items are the best and which ones were not so good okay but let's uh, look at question uh, six here from a previous uh, multi-choice uh, Right, so uh, U is 36, uh, NU is 53, so that's 36 people. Out of the 53 people in the upper group, we're getting uh, this question 6 correct. Uh, only 17 people out of 53 people in the lower group, we're getting the item correct. Okay, and you shove that into the formula. Uh, 36 divided by 36 divided by 53 minus 17 divided by 53 equals... 0.36. Okay, so that's good and positive. I'd be quite happy with that, to be honest. Okay. However, question number one, which you remember, that this is the one where it had a very close to ceiling effect, as in most people uh, were getting the item correct. The item difficulty was, uh, I think, 92% or something, uh, and that's being reflected in these scores because uh, the item difficulty is so far away from that midpoint. Uh, uh, basically there's, we can't really tell people apart at all because all the people in the lower group are also getting it right as well as the people in the upper group okay so 50 out of 53 people in the upper group are getting it right 45 out of 53 in the lower group are getting it right 50, uh, uh, 50 divided by 45 minus uh, uh, 50 uh, sorry 50 divided by 53 minus 45 divided by 53 is equal to 0 0.09 so pretty much close to zero item question number one really isn't helping discriminate that's fine in this case because of course the multi-choice exam is criterion reference not norm referenced but if we were norm if it was norm reference then question one would be straight out the window
Okay, question four. Uh, that'd be 22 divided by 53 minus 11 by 53.21. So, yeah, positive, but not, not as great as the other ones. Question 23, if you remember question 23, this is the one that had the uh, most optimal item difficulty index, and that uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a great question, but in this case it does actually map onto quite a decent item discrimination index, so 47 over 53 minus 23 over 53 equals 45, uh, 0.45. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty strong, and it's the strongest out of the ones I've looked at here. And question 28, we've got 50, uh, 37 divided by 53 minus 24 divided by 53 is 0.25. So sort of middling, middling to weak question. Okay, I should point out there in all the examples I've used here, uh, the number in the upper group. Uh, has been exactly the same as the number of in the lower group, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, for example, you, you've got odd numbers of people or people who are getting sort of similar scores to one another. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that you'll get equal numbers in each group. Okay, and in fact, that's probably what you will find when you have to work out this statistic for assignment two. Okay, right, let's look at uh, item uh, discrimination index. Uh, and how we would calculate it if instead of wanting to look at its effect on internal consistency we wanted to look at its effect on validity right okay the way we're going to do it this is uh, this would be where all of these eight people here they're going to be doing the uh, original quiz but then we're going to get them to do a different test that happens to be measuring the same thing Okay, so essentially that could be criterion validity or it could be uh, convergent validity. Okay, so this second test is some well established, previously validated uh, measure. I did get a couple of questions last week where people were saying, ah, oh, yeah, can something be both uh, an example of criterion validity and an example of uh, convergent validity? So the answer is uh, yes. So the uh, different uh, categories I gave you there aren't uh, mutually exclusive, they can sort of overlap and you can quite often in literature you'll find the same statistic referred to in one context as criterion validity and the other context as conversion validity. Okay, right, let's talk about the uh, scores then. Okay, so here's our scores for items one, two, four. This is our criterion score where they've uh, done this separate criterion uh, test and that's the score they get on the test. Okay, so. Right, we've already looked at the uh, overall criterion validity by looking at the score correlation between the overall score on the criterion and the overall score on the test. Okay, like so. <coughs> and that turns out to be pretty good. So you can see if people are getting uh, high scores in uh, the uh, sort of a test that we're evaluating here they also tend to get very high scores on the criterion you get low scores on the test here they tend to get lower scores on the criterion so the correlation between that and that is 0.93 very very high so the test has got overall has got good uh, validity the question is uh, which of those four items is uh, doing the business which one of them is best contributing to that very good uh, overall validity <coughs> Right, because of course, even though that's very good, 0.93 is very good, we could increase that number if we got rid of, say, one of the items that uh, was contributing least to that score. Okay, this is what we do. We defined upper and lower groups just before, but this time we're going to do it based on the criterion measure, not the overall test score. Okay, so... Looking at the criterion measure, the two highest scores, okay, remember we're taking the top 25% as eight people, so top 25% is the uh, top two scores. That's uh, this one here, Simon and Zoe. Lower group is, uh, you go, Monique has got 45, Jessica's got uh, 49, those are the two lowest scores, so that's going to be our upper group, that's going to be our lower group, okay. Um, yeah, notice it's the same, happens to be the same people as in my reliability example, but that's more just because 
uh, of uh, that I've chosen these numbers to make the things uh, very very simple so that's pretty unlikely to happen in real life Right, what we do for each item, we count up the number of people in the high scoring group. So that's uh, again Zoe and Simon who got the item correct, and the number of people in the low scoring group who got the item uh, correct. And then we proceed exactly as before. Okay, and uh, because we end up with the same two people in the upper group and the same two people as the lower group, as for our reliability, uh, it so happens that uh, the scores will pretty much come out exactly the same okay so uh, so for item number one for example uh, two of the high scorers uh, both high scorers are getting it correct uh, and only one of the low scorers is getting it correct so u is two l is one n u is two that's the number of people in the upper group and l is two the number of people in the lower group shove that into the same item discrimination formula as before okay and uh, otherwise it's exactly the same okay as for when we're doing it for reliability so the only difference between the two is how you define the other group and the lower group All right okay so what does uh, D the item discrimination index mean in this circumstance uh, well if D is equal to 1 it means that again all the people all the higher scorers are getting it correct all the low scorers are getting it incorrect so where the groups are, in this case groups are defined by this external criterion measure okay then basically the closer the D is to 1 the more uh, that item is contributing to that uh, criterion validity or convergent validity if you prefer okay so yeah, D equals 1 all of the people in the upper group have got it right D equals 1 then all the people in the lower group have got the item incorrect okay just as before if D equals 0 no difference in the performance between the high scorers and the low scorers okay where uh, effectively it means that the item has is having no uh, has no contribution to the criterion validity. Essentially, it means that that item uh, cannot predict the criterion. Okay, so you really want to get rid of it, and so forth. All right, and uh, yeah, and as I say, the scores, uh, uh, the item discrimination index. Uh, for validity. In this particular example comes out exactly the same as the ones for reliability. In real life that's uh, unlikely to happen. It's just because of the numbers I've picked here and because uh, I made the uh, criterion and the test score very very highly correlated. That's why it's coming out like that. Right, but what this would mean is that items 2 and 3 are contributing most of the validity of the uh, quiz whereas the items number one and number four are contributing uh, less, although yeah, point five is still very very good. So I wouldn't be uh, getting rid of any of these to be honest. All right, okay. Item discrimination index for personality type measures. Okay, this is what you will be doing in uh, your assignment two, where you are looking at personality type measure where there is no right and wrong answer. Okay, so. There's just a slight extra step we have to do uh, to go through to get the item discrimination index for these personality type measures. Okay, right, so here we go. It's got the same eight people, and this time they're doing a four item personality test where it's a Likert type scale where they can have a response from one to five. So Jess getting five, two, four, and three, Monique's two, one, one, and three, and so forth. And we work out the total questionnaire score by just simply summing the responses across all uh, of those four items okay right so what we want to do for these items uh, which is what you will be doing for assignment two you want to work out the item discrimination index for reliability uh, in order to decide which of these items are the ones you want to keep and which of the items you want to get rid of right so uh, look in assignment 2 briefing for how for the steps you need to go through to do this in SPSS and also your uh, your tutor will take this uh, take you through this in the class let me get around to that 
Right, crucial thing here is that what we're going to do is choose some threshold uh, above which we're going to call the response correct in inverted commas and below which we're going to call the response incorrect in inverted commas. Okay, just for the convenience of calculating. So we're not actually, we don't actually mean it's correct or incorrect, we're just going to label it like that for the sake of the calculation. Okay, so we've got a five point scale, so why don't we pick uh, a rough midpoint? Well, we'll pick three as our threshold uh, that gives us a roughly halfway split, or as close as a halfway split we can get on a five point scale. So, what we're going to do is replace all responses with either correct or incorrect based on that threshold of three. So, that is any score which is three, four, and five, we're going to call correct, and any score with one or two, we're going to call incorrect. Okay, so when you come to do it on your scale, then you just want to pick a rough, some rough midpoint. So I could have picked uh, four, so four or five, and it would become incorrect would have been one, two, three, and correct would have been four or five. You'll more or less end up with the same sort of numbers if you do that. Okay, so there you go. For item number one, five becomes correct because it's uh, three or more. Two becomes incorrect because it's less than three. 4 is correct because it's more than 3, 3 is correct because it's 3 or more, and so forth. Okay, so that is, instead of having those Likert type responses for your item number 1, you'll instead have correct and incorrect. Okay. Right, once you've got those responses coded as either incorrect and correct, we basically just then proceed exactly as we did before. There we go where we, uh, we've got our total score okay, for the questionnaire we've got the correct versus incorrect uh, values there uh, and then we go ahead and work out things like the upper group uh, lower group based on the total score and then calculate the U's and the L's and the NU's and the NL's uh, exactly as in the previous examples okay right Okay, so all that sort of stuff uh, is uh, ideally what you, you uh, that, that's really helping us, especially if we've got a norm referenced uh, test. What could we do if we had a criterion reference test? Okay, well, I've got a classic example of that here that uh, my basic knowledge for Kanoskobist's assessment. There is someone doing a Kanoskobi or someone. Okay, what well, basically it's all about how I'm going to define that upper group and that lower group. So if I've got a criterion reference test, what I could do is pick the upper group and the lower group based on whether they should fulfill the criteria or not. Uh, so for example, uh, in this particular case with the colonoscopists, I would expect uh, experienced colonoscopists uh, should know all the answers to all the questions, you would, you would hope. And then we want to compare them with a second group of people where they shouldn't know anything about colonoscopy and they should get all the questions wrong so that's going to be my lower group and uh, in this particular example it was uh, psychology undergraduates okay so the experienced colonoscopists become, colonoscopists become the upper group the novices become the lower group okay and then we can work out the item discrimination indices just as before but it's just the how we define the upper group and the lower group has just changed. Okay, so that is the experience. Colonoscopists become all the people in the upper group, and the novices become all the people in the lower group. Okay, um, if uh, it was uh, a, a, if it's a multiple choice for criterion reference test, as it was in this case, uh, then the other thing I'd be doing is seeing whether that novice group were performing above chance on any of the questions, because that probably means that the question was worded in such a way that you could sort of guess the answer or at least you, you didn't know, didn't need to have a colonoscopist's knowledge to know the answer to that question. Yep. Uh, final thing I'd do is, uh, I'd, well I did, is look at items that the experienced colonoscopists were performing particularly poorly on because that could mean that we've, uh, that there's a problem with the question. So one thing we know with uh, uh, surgeons is that they tend to disagree with all of you put three surgeons in the room you'll get five different opinions uh, and so there could be questions in there where 
for example, the person advising our team, the colonoscopist advising our team, might simply be at odds with some of the experienced colonoscopists who were, who were actually taking part in this study, and we basically needed to follow that up to find out whether that was the case or not, or whether it's the case that the experienced colonoscopists simply didn't know the information that we were asking, which is a bit of a worry, but certainly would not necessarily be surprising. Okay, right, here's another thing you can do, another strategy. So for multi-choice questions, uh, you can uh, get an awful lot of information by literally just eyeballing uh, the uh, options that people uh, chose uh, if you divide people up into the high scorer and low scorer groups. Okay, so here's some items here where we've got, uh, so this is a uh, five option multiple choice uh, quiz and uh, Here's item number one, the A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, C, D and E are the five options that they can choose in this multiple choice question. And the one that's starred there, that's the correct answer. So A is the correct answer. Okay, and here's our high scorers, and this is the number of people in the high scorer group who responded to each of these options. And this is the number of people in the low scoring group who responded to each of these options. Okay, if I look, just by eyeballing that, this looks pretty good, okay, so in the sense that uh, there's a much greater proportion of people in the high scorer group getting the answer correct, which is exactly what we would predict. Uh, however, notice that people in both the high scorer group and the low scorer group, their responses to the people who are getting it wrong, their responses to the distractors are pretty well spread across the remaining four options. So obviously D was one that wasn't fooling any of the uh, high scorers who got the question wrong. But for the low scorers, D was uh, just as plausible as A, B, C, uh, A, uh, sorry, as uh, B, C, D, or E. Okay, so that looks like a pretty uh, good question. Uh, we've got distractor, uh, plausible distractors. Oops. Okay, uh, here's another item here. Uh, okay, uh, this isn't a problem item here. So here we can see that in the high scorer group. Nobody gets this question wrong, all 32 of them are uh, getting the question correct. And at the low scorer group, that's fine, a high, lower proportion of them are getting the, uh, the question correct, but still most of them are getting it right. And the people who are getting it wrong, their responses are evenly spread across the other distractors, suggesting that all those distractors are uh, equally plausible. There aren't any silly distractors in there that people were just uh, uh, ignoring. Okay, here's another item here. Right, so here I, uh, E is the correct answer, and we can see that uh, uh, out of the high scorers, uh, 12 people are choosing the correct answer E, but look in the high scorer group, uh, 13 of them are also choosing B. Okay, so the question is uh, because it's uh, these people in the high score group, as in these are the people who are you expect to be top of your class and should be sort of getting a high score. It could mean that there's a problem with option B that for some reason B is either misleading or maybe it's being incorrectly risk scored and B is actually the correct answer. Okay, but I want to look at to uh, double check that que a question like that to see whether there was something to do with B that meant that uh, that people were being unfairly misled. It could be that there's nothing wrong with this question whatsoever, and it could be that B was a very, just a very good distractor and it was appropriately misleading them, but I want to check that out. Okay. Uh, with the lower scorers in this thing, we're getting rough, sp uh, even spread across all five categories, so that they're absolutely fine. They, they basically haven't got a clue as to which is the right answer. They're obviously just guessing. Right, uh, item number four here. So this is absolutely f seems to be absolutely fine uh, in the... the a uh, greater proportion of people in the highest scoring group than the low scoring group are getting uh, item B correct, uh, but there's a reasonable spread across the other items. And uh, but look, here's in the low scorer group, we've got a whole bunch of people choosing E. Okay, unlike with this item number two, I'm not worried about this one here because uh, E. Uh, is unlikely to be uh, unfairly misleading because it didn't distract a particularly high proportion of people from the high scoring group. Okay, that is the low scorers are the people you expect to screw up and get it all wrong. Okay, so the fact they've all picked E 
probably does is more likely to mean that E was just a good distractor that they that uh, they all thought was the right answer, rather than uh, that there was a particular problem with E. Right. Okay, and uh, here we go. Item number five. Here's our topsy turvy world going insane, uh, uh, everything going upside down uh, item, where you can see D is the correct answer, but the people in the high scorer group are all picking either A or E, and only five of them picked B, uh, D. However, in the low scorer group, uh, everyone's picking uh, D, so this would give us a negative item discrimination index. Okay, but it, uh, what does this actually mean? It probably means that uh, you've either chosen the wrong item, the wrong option to be the correct response or there's something misleading about the question where all these people who should be doing really well are picking A or uh, A or E. Okay, so there, there might be well be something, very likely to be something wrong with the question there at some level. Right, okay, with all of the item analyses uh, that I've just been showing you, uh, absolutely none of them are appropriate for speed tests. Okay, so to remind you, uh, we can divide, t one way we can divide up tests are into power tests, which are basically what I've been more or less talking about, where you've got lots of time and it's all about how difficult the content of each of the items is. Uh, and then on the other hand, we've got speed tests where all the items are very, very easy, uh, but you've only got a limited amount of time, so it's more about how fast you can rattle through the items. So if you're using a speed test like that, we can't use item analyses at all because the thing that is discriminating uh, between people who are good or bad on a speed test isn't whether they get any one particular item correct in terms of the item's content, it's about how fast they're shoving, shoveling their way through all the items. So that is whether they get an item correct or incorrect isn't about the content of the item, it's about whether the item is at the beginning of the test or whether it's at the end of the test where they're, they're less likely to get it right at the end of the test because they simply won't have got to it because the test the, they would have run out of time before they got to the last item. Okay, so uh, yeah, and just to remind you, here's my example of a speed test where uh, you just have to say uh, for each row determine which but the first number is the same as different from the second number right and D the numbers are different so very very simple task okay but uh, you get uh, basically far more items than you could possibly do in the time and we just count up uh, how many items you complete in the time so any test like that you can't do item statistics okay that was the big section that was step uh, number three okay but we're now into the home straight so step number four if it all works consider improving your measure using data from your item analyses okay okay so basically you've done all the item analyses you've got a wealth of information as to uh, how well the, all of the items are doing so remember this is a situation where ideally what we would, would do is put in far more items than we actually needed for the final test so we have the scope to basically go and zap all of the items which have uh, poor item difficulty or poor item discrimination or had some other problem flagged from one of the other item analyses so this is a step where we can uh, well if we wanted to we could add new items we want to do we could delete items we could alter items and then uh, sort of retest it and once you've come up with your final version then uh, it might be this might be a good time to go then go and uh, give it to a large representative sample that could be your standardization sample assuming you can't get that get that data from what you've already uh, data you've already uh, gathered right and that leads us very swiftly into step number five which is uh, the end so basically release your new measure into the wild and watch it run free improving the world forever right okay that's the end of uh, this uh, video lecture so uh, ah, and I actually managed it all the way through the lecture without vomiting or diarrhea -ing at all so you'll be very pleased not, not that you necessarily wanted that level of detail uh, okay next week uh, we've actually got uh, a very special guest lecture from uh, associate professor Marcus Watson who's an executive director 
of the Skills Development Centre at Queensland Health and he's also uh, an ex-commando uh, where he's going to be doing about a half an hour talk uh, talking about uh, application of uh, the sort of things we've been learning in this course human mo measurement and how it's absolutely crucial to uh, healthcare and how they really really need uh, people like us who understand this sort of thing or who will understand this sort of thing so the half an hour on that and then I'll be talking uh, about, I'll be giving the very first of the lectures on intelligence. So uh, we've, with this lecture we've pretty much finished uh, the core psychometric technical stuff. Uh, next week we'll uh, be a bit, little bit more relaxed, a bit less uh, calculations and we'll be talking about uh, intelligence and all of the controversies that surround it. Okay, so hopefully next week I'll be able to see you there in person. Cheerio.